Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I've got something special for you, namely a radio program. So a few days ago, Jonathan McCormick, the producer and narrator of this program that I'm about to play back to you, contacted me saying that as a freelance journalist, he had produced a broadcast about the roots of the Ukraine war, which as usual outlet Radio Slovakia International refused to air. He was given various reasons, but the bottom line is that the story was simply too controversial, given the prevailing political mood in the country and in the West more generally. Jonathan reached out to me to ask if I wanted to publish it, and hell yes I do, because he created a wonderful short radio piece featuring three interesting personalities. First, Ruslan Kotsaba, a Ukrainian journalist and pacifist who some years ago was imprisoned in Ukraine for his peace activism and now lives in exile in Brooklyn. Then, for the sake of balance, he also asked for comment from Slovakia's foremost Russia expert, Alexander Duleba, whom he had interviewed a number of times before. And last but not least, he also got extensive comments from a good friend of this show, Nikolai Petro, who's a professor of political science at Rhode Island University. What seems to have made this piece too controversial for the Europeans was simply that Jonathan approached the story like a real journalist, trying to find answers and not to conform the story to predetermined narratives. So please have a listen to what Europeans these days find too controversial to be broadcasted. Since Russia invaded Ukrainian territory in February of last year, we in the West, including here in Slovakia, have been hearing a version of events which many Western experts regard as being oversimplified, a version which leaves out or downplays crucial factors that led to the war, such as, for example, the internal conflict which has been raging within Ukraine since 2014 and which was a key factor, they say, in Russia's decision to intervene. I recently had the opportunity to speak with someone who not only experienced that internal conflict firsthand, but who also worked very hard for a long time to try to stop it. My name is Ruslan Kotsaba and I am a war correspondent and I am a founder of the Ukrainian pacifist movement. Although Ruslan Kotsaba is from the western Ukrainian-speaking part of Ukraine, his work as a war correspondent brought him in touch with the Russian-speaking populations in the east of the country, as a result of which he began to see things from their perspective as well. This led him to become a vocal peace activist, eventually founding the Ukrainian Pacifist Movement, one of three such organizations recently nominated by the International Peace Bureau for the Nobel Peace Prize. His pacifism also led him, crucially, to oppose the Ukrainian government's role in the country's internal conflict. For his efforts as a pacifist, he has been physically attacked, labeled as a Russian propagandist, spent a year and a half in a Ukrainian prison, prompting Amnesty International to call him a prisoner of conscience, and finally decided to flee the country last year when facing a possible life sentence for the alleged crime of treason. He is now living in exile in Brooklyn, New York, where I met with him and his interpreter, Nata Pachomkin, at a local library in May. The first thing I wanted to ask Ruslan Kotsaba was, how exactly did his work as a war correspondent lead to his becoming such a committed peace activist? My work as a war correspondent made the question Am I am I human? Should I work as a pacifist? Should I should I struggle against the war? Instead of just reporting on the war. It was happening in a parallel. I was working. But in my work, in my job as a war correspondent, I considered both points of view on this war. Okay, well, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, why did you decide to do this on both sides? And what was your experience in seeing both of these perspectives? I consider this as a standards of objective journalism. The second side of this conflict, the second part of the population of Ukraine, was humiliated, was dehumanized by uh, Ukrainian government. And my position was to listen that side, to let them speak aloud. But were those Russian-speaking people of eastern Ukraine really being humiliated and dehumanized, as Ruslan Kutsaba puts it, by their own government? 
And if so, how was this happening? It's well known that, among other things, one of their chief complaints after the so-called Maidan Revolution in 2014, in which an avidly anti-Russian government took power, was that certain measures were being taken by the new government suppressing the use of the Russian language, their native language, in public places. But did this alone, or in combination with other moves by the new government, humiliate and dehumanize the Russian-speaking population in eastern Ukraine? Some experts think not. I'm Alexander Duleba, professor in political science. I'm uh, teaching at the University of Presho, international relations, and I have a special courses on the Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I'm focusing on Ukraine and Russia. So I'm following the situation in Eastern Europe more or less in a systematic manner since 1993. Alexander Duleba is also the founder of the Slovak Foreign Policy Association, a foreign policy think tank based here in Bratislava. He is also widely regarded as Slovakia's top expert on Ukraine and Russia and is widely known to be a strong supporter of the post-Maidan Ukrainian government. I wanted to hear what he had to say about Ruslan Kotsaba's claims regarding that same government's treatment of its Russian-speaking citizens in the eastern part of the country. Were these citizens being humiliated and dehumanized by their own government? When it comes to the rights of Russian-speaking people in Ukraine after Maidan, Yes, there was an attempt to change the language law, which would make like problematic to use the Russian language in official communication with the state authorities and so on. But it was stopped. Still in Ukraine is valid a uh, law adopted by Yanukovych government of 2010, which says that Ukrainian language is an official language in the country, but regions uh, regional authorities, elected regional parliaments, can adopt laws by which they will introduce other language used on the territory of Ukraine as a second official language. And there's a list of, if I remember it rightly, nine uh, languages, and Russian is on the language number one, like historical languages, that there are people who live there for centuries simply. And it happened almost in all Russian-speaking regions of Eastern Ukraine. It happened that the regional parliaments introduced Russian as the secondary official language to official communication. And it's also other, including like Ruthenian in Transcarpathian region. So what's the problem? Look, since 2019, the president of Ukraine comes from Eastern Russian-speaking region. This is President Zelensky also his party. So it's impossible to say that there is a fascist rule in Ukraine that would discriminate like Russian-speaking population. It's at this point that it becomes a bit difficult to know just what to think. On the one hand, we have Ruslan Kotsaba, by all appearances a man of integrity who has lived through this conflict and suffered for his beliefs at the hands of his own government, saying one thing, and on the other hand, we have Alexander Duleba, someone who has studied Ukraine for a long time and is quite knowledgeable about the situation there, saying the opposite. In an effort to arrive at a better understanding of the situation, I turned to another expert on Ukraine, whose research I knew to be focused mainly on the internal conflict within the country, rather than on the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, and who I therefore hoped might be able to give me some better sense of what's been happening in the country since 2014. So I'm Nikolai N. Petro. For more than 30 years now, I've been a professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island. But before coming here, I spent some time in Washington, where I was a Council on Foreign Relations fellow. I was also a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. The former gave me the opportunity to work in the State Department as Special Advisor for Policy in the Office of Soviet Union Affairs. Nikolai Petro was also invited by the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in 2008 to give talks on the future of Ukraine and has visited the country nearly every year since then, spending two whole years there as a visiting scholar. He has also recently published a book with the curious title, The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict Resolution, a book which takes a close look at the conflict within Ukraine since 2014 and its long historical roots. Although he's quick to point out that he believes Russia's invasion last year was in no way justified, his book explores the key role played by Ukraine's internal conflict in creating the conditions that led to the war. 
As I had just finished reading this book, I decided to get his perspective on the opposing claims of Ruslan Kotsaba and Alexander Duleba. But first I was curious as to whether he himself, with all the time he spent in Ukraine, had actually heard of Kotsaba and his story. Absolutely. He came to prominence when he decried the illegality of conscription for the anti-terrorist operation in the East. He said this was against the Constitution. He was defended by a famous lawyer, Tatiana Mantian, and won, I think, his case, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. I think after he spent a year and a half in prison. Both of them are now in exile <laughs> and charged with treason. So then, what is his opinion of Ruslan Kotsaba and his peace activism? So Ruslan Kotsaba, in my opinion, as a Western Ukrainian, represents an alternative vision for Ukrainian identity. Specifically, it is one that was promoted and popular 20 years ago by the famous leader of the political opposition in Western Ukraine, Vyacheslav Chernovil. Vyacheslav Chernovil was the leader of Ruch, the movement, as it's mm-hmm. called in Ukrainian, which was the initial popular movement for Ukrainian independence. Their vision of a united Ukraine does not mistake vengeance regarding the past for justice. The problem with vengeance, taking revenge on what was done to Ukrainians and specifically Western Ukrainians, is that it always renews the cycle of tragedy, since there will always be the next generation that seeks to reestablish its version of justice at the expense of the other. So the only way to break this cycle, and this is what I think Katsaba and Chernovil both understood, is to break the cycle and strive for what the Greeks called true justice. And true justice is an outcome acceptable to all parties. So it's clear then that Nikolai Petro believes Ruslan Kotsaba is not just making noise, but is seriously engaged in an honest effort to break the cycle of hatred and violence within Ukraine. What does he have to say then about Alexander Duleba's claims that the post-Maidan Ukrainian government does not discriminate against its Russian-speaking citizens in the East? And what about Duleba's claim that there was only one law passed against the Russian language and that this law was repealed years ago? But this is incorrect. Okay, so explain, please. Yeah. History didn't stop in May of 2014. We have had numerous additional language laws, including the imposition since 2019 of a government language ombudsman. Uh Let me just give you a quote from that first ombudsman. There have since been two others. But the first one, Tatiana Manakhova, explained the purpose of her office in 2019 in these words, quote, the dream was always to cultivate, build, or construct a powerful, homogeneous Ukrainian monolith, a society of the like-minded who speak the state language having no disagreements on major issues of state. Monoliths are created by using both whips and pastries, end quote. Uh So the objective, by the way, why did she resign? She resigned because she felt she was not given the tools needed to impose the whips and to offer the pastries. This issue has since been rectified in twenty early 2021 with the ability given to the language ombudsman to impose fines for the public use of Russian, meaning in the public sphere. Because right now, if you use Russian in a public service capacity, that can be fined. Even in a private service capacity, for example, if I go to a restaurant, a private restaurant, private institution, and I order in Russian, the waiter has the right to refuse to serve me unless we come to an agreement on the language to be spoken. But the presumptive language that must be spoken by law is now Ukrainian. Even in a restaurant? Even in a restaurant. 
According to Nikolai Petro, then, not only was the suppression of the Russian language in Ukraine not stopped, but it has even intensified in recent years. So then why does Alexander Duluba insist that there is no problem when it comes to the use of the Russian language in Ukraine today? The answer to that question began to become a bit more clear when I asked him about one of the more disturbing observations made by Nikolai Petro in his book concerning how the current Ukrainian government plans to deal with its rebellious eastern citizens after they've been subdued and are once again under full Ukrainian control, assuming this eventually happens. These plans, which are well documented in Petro's book, involve placing strict limits on the rights of these citizens until after they have gone through a kind of re-education process designed to eradicate all Russian influence in the region, even cultural influence. Alexander Duluba's answer suggests not only that he sees no problem with this, but also that the only reason those Russian speakers perceive this as humiliating, in his view, is that they have an imperialistic mindset left over from the days of the Soviet Union. No, because this suppression or humiliation, I can, you, you know, if you speak Russian, okay, you just watch uh, Russian TV, you live with the Russian politics, and you live in Ukraine, okay, and if the official authorities, simply if you go to the office, the public administration office, hospital, whatever, and they ask you, please, so Ukraine language is also here, so you, you feel it as a humiliation of your rights. But, you know, this is a problem of those Russian-speaking people, you know, who were not able simply to, to adapt, to absorb the situation that Soviet Union doesn't exist more, that there's no Russian empire, that they are citizens of Ukrainian state. So that's it. I mean, any state in Europe, look at France, look at, I don't know, Spain, you know, Catalonia issues or whatever. Uh, look at, uh, I mean, what is the French policy in that? You are French because you are a member of the political nation and this political nation has its rules, its language, etc. And so that is about any nation. If you are not, you know, satisfied with that, but still this nation doesn't humiliate your rights. You can speak Russian, but you have to accept that you live in other countries simply and this is official language and there's public administration, hospitals, schools, etc. You know, and if you have the problem with that, so look, it says about your imperialistic mind and your incapacity to become an, a normal people. You want that the state should be subordinated to you? Nikolai Petro responds. When he said, or he asked you rhetorically, do you want the state to be subordinate to you? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. We call that liberal democracy. That is the essence of modern liberal democracy. Secondly, he asks, he asserts that the political nation has one language, one philological language. That is clearly not the case. It is virtually never the case in the EU because it is precisely the hallmark of the EU to be pluricultural and liberal and to encourage minority languages and their usage. Many countries in the EU are bilingual and even trilingual. And even in countries that aspire to a single cultural standard, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, regional differences are respected and protected by the law. That is not the case in Ukraine today. This argument, the argument that Duluba makes it is based on an ideological principle of nationalism, and specifically that it will guarantee national unity by marginalizing and eradicating, pulling up from the roots, minorities that are not tolerated in a monist political nation. But in fact, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. He makes reference to the fact that those who choose to speak Russian in a Ukrainian-speaking political nation are held back by their own imperialism. But I'm afraid you could view the shoe as being on the other foot entirely. It is imperialism to insist on the speaking of Ukrainian, on linguistic monism, especially when one considers the fact that in most major cities of the Ukraine, 80% of the population is more comfortable speaking Russian. 
Citing other work commitments, Alexander Duleba declined to respond to any of Nikolai Petro's comments in this story. One of the points made by Alexander Duleba, which at first seemed to me not at all controversial, was in regard to Ukraine's current education law. So we have the education law. It was adopted in 2017, but I have to say that it's identical to the education law we have in Slovakia. Why? Because actually it introduces as a compulsory subject Ukrainian language. Because before there were schools, you know, run only on the uh, language of ethnic minority. There was no subject like the Ukraine. I think it's a normal that every state, if you are a citizen of uh, Ukraine, that as a natural that you, in the school, you have to learn Ukrainian. I think it's normal. You can have all subjects in your native language, but you have to learn also Ukrainian, and that's it. Sounds reasonable to me, but is that all there is to it? Here's Nikolai Petro's response. That is an oversimplification because accompanying the mandatory instruction in all subjects in Ukrainian is what we have seen, in fact, the shutting down of any alternative schools and the systematic elimination throughout eastern and southern Ukraine of schools offering Russian language classes if students and the parents of students wish to organize such classes. The motivation for not allowing Russian language courses to be organized, even on a voluntary basis in schools, is obviously politically motivated. So what you're saying is that it's not just a case of them having to take Ukrainian as a compulsory subject, but what exactly are they trying to shut down these schools? Are they trying to convert yes. everything? Into yes, they are trying to make Ukrainian. The law anticipates eventually the elimination of alternative education at all levels. What happens if somebody wants to continue with an existing school that has already been teaching Russian? There are no schools that teach Russian. No, it's gone. In Ukraine. I mean... I hesitate to say no schools because the figures that I've seen speak of 95 to 99% of Russian language schools shut down in Ukraine over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you the net effect of that has not been to reduce the popularity of Russian among youth. Okay, so all these laws are not really having an effect on what language people prefer to use on a regular basis with their friends at the bar or whatever. And is it a goal of the government to even eliminate Russian in this kind of casual, social, out with friends type of environment? The, or is goal, that the goal, according to the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Committee, Alexei Danilov, the goal is, quote, the Russian language must completely disappear from our territory, it being an aspect of hostile propaganda and the brainwashing of our population, end quote. Wow. That's the goal. But I can't imagine that it's a realistic goal. I mean, how would they even, does anybody really think that they'd be able to accomplish that? In an ideological world, you follow your fantasies. That is the danger of nationalism, mm -hmm. is that it is a fantasy, not a reality. And implementing that fantasy has devastating consequences, not just on the individual, but on the body politic as a whole. 